spread first search and depth first search. And we, we also talked about the problems we had in the breadth first search. Oh, sorry. Oh, the demo is not working. Um, what was the major problem of breadth first search? I mean, if we compare it to uh, depth first search, it's not slower. What is the disadvantage of breadth first search compared to depth first search? The high memory consumption. Yes, that's the problem. We, it is not practically implementable because we don't have such uh, large memories we would need. Huh? Okay. Um, so then next we talked about uh, depth first search and as you can see on these uh, graphs here on these trees, search trees, the memory consumption no longer grows exponentially with the depth, it only grows uh, linearly with the depth. Yeah? Because what we have to store uh, basically, you can see it here, is the depth of the tree times the branching factor. That's what we need in storage consumption, so it only grows linearly with the depth. Um, but what is the problem with uh, depth first search? It is not practical either because <coughs> yes, it is not optimal. Uh, so that means suppose there, there is a solution here, but if we run down there and find a solution here, this is not it does not find the optimal solution. Okay, but this, I would consider this a minor problem. Huh? We have a more severe problem here. Not it's not complete. What does that mean? Okay, at least you remember the term. Huh? Um, not complete means it may be the case uh, that there is a solution, but depth first doesn't, search does not find it. When does that happen? In which cases? On infinite trees. Yes, mo a, a little bit more precise. Depth. Yeah. If we have a tree with infinite depth, then our depth first search runs down infinitely as soon as it reaches the branch with infinite depth. And if the solution is to the right of this infinitely deep branch, it will never reach that point. And actually, if you implement it recursively, what would happen to your program? you would get a stack overflow. Huh? No matter how large your stack size is, eventually you will get a stack overflow. Okay, so then uh, the solution for the whole thing is iterative deepening. Huh? This actually combines the advantages of depth first search and breadth first search. So we do have very uh, little memory consumption and it is complete. And I proved last time that, I mean, of course there is, it looks like there is a lot of redundant work, but it is not. Huh? I mean, if we search the whole tree up to a depth of six, then we do a complete restart with a new limit of 7, uh, but 
the redundancy is small. Uh, so actually what counts is the size of the search tree on the last step. Uh, you can neglect the rest if, under which condition? If the average branching factor of our search tree is not too small. So as soon as the average branching factor is bigger than two, then you can neglect uh, the, uh, the, the previous work. Huh? If the branching factor is extremely small, like 1.01, huh? uh, then uh, there is quite a bit of redundant work. Huh? But then if the branching factor is so extremely small, we actually don't have a search problem because then search is really tractable and we might even be able to do breadth first search because uh, the, the tree doesn't really explode. But in, in realistic problems we do have uh, quite big average search uh, branching factors maybe like 30 or 100 or 1000 uh, that's uh, what we have in realistic problems. Okay, here we have the source code. Um, yeah, we did the analysis and yes, did we look at this tab table here? No. Okay, here we have the comparison and we actually talked about most of it. Um, yeah, and look at the last column. We have the the positive results almost everywhere. Huh? Um, yeah, I mean here the yes uh, uh, that the iterative deepening finds the optimal solution. This is only true um, if our costs for expansion of nodes are constant. Huh? If the costs uh, vary, then um, we have to do something else, but we will see this later. And we will talk about a star algorithm today, and there is a variant with iterative deepening, and then we, we are optimal. Uh, okay, it is complete. Uh, computation time is the same as we had before, and uh, memory consumption is very uh, low too. Okay, so now let's talk about heuristic search. Because even if we do iterative deepening, um, we won't solve realistic problems. Huh? Because the branching factor is quite big and we did some computations like in chess, there is no chance to search the whole tree in such problems. Okay, so, and also our, we know that there are human chess players who are excellent players, even though their, the clock speed in their brain is pretty small. So, um, I mean, we know from neuroscience that the clock speed in our brain is something like uh, not more than 100 operations per second. Huh? So this is extremely small as compared to uh, digital computers. But anyway, we know that there are human chess players who are excellent. So you see, they are not able to check many nodes per second. Actually, if you, if you look at how many uh, board positions per second a human chess player can evaluate, this is very small, maybe it's one board position per second. Huh? So it's a factor of maybe 100,000 slower than a uh, uh, computer is. So there must be some heuristic process going on in our brain that reduces the average branching factor dramatically. Huh? So we know that uh, human chess players uh, can do a look ahead of uh, 10 or even more half moves and this means if you look at the, the whole search tree, that's extremely large and it is impossible for the human chess player to evaluate all these positions uh, from one move to the next. So the effective 
final branching factor is extremely small, so there must be some heuristic process going on that reduces uh, the search space. And now let's talk about heuristic search. What is a heuristic? Heuristics are problem-solving strategies which in many cases find a solution uh, faster than the algorithms we have seen before, which are uninformed search. Huh? I mean, it's interesting that it says in many cases find solu a solution faster, but there is no guarantee. There is no guarantee that heuristic search is faster. Huh? Um, in everyday life, heuristic methods are very important. We use heuristics all the time when we do anything. When we make coffee, when we search something in a room, uh, when we search for a parking spot for our car, whatever. Huh? Um, yeah, and, uh, quite a good example is suppose like it was to, uh, this morning, there is fog in the Schussenthal and you want to walk from here over to the other side of the Schussenthal. And suppose you're a hiker and you come from this direction and you don't know this area and you don't have a map. So you just come down from the hills and then you see this valley, you see the fog and on the other side you see the church of the uh, village of Belk. Huh? And you want to walk there. So what would you do? What would you do then? So you don't have a map, you don't know the area, you speak a foreign language so you can't ask anybody. So in which direction would you walk? So you see the church of Belk in this direction. So what direction would you take? The shortest path. The shortest path. So you would walk exactly in this direction. This is a heuristics. There is no guarantee that this is the optimal path to Belk. Suppose below the fog there is a Grand Canyon, the whole Schussenthal. And then you would walk straight towards the cliff on the Grand Canyon and so after two hours of walking you would see the cliff and you would know, okay, there is no chance to continue in this direction and then probably you would walk, have to walk up all the way to Mochenwangen and around the canyon on the, on the other side with, uh, back. Yeah? Um, so it would have been actually better to walk in this direction uh, if you would have known it. So that's the, the nature of heuristic search. So very often, most of the time, the heuristics is good, uh, but it may be extremely bad. Uh. That's the nature of heuristics. Yeah. So it's kind of um, taking real-time decision under limited knowledge. Yeah. Limited knowledge, and limited knowledge is due to limited resources. I mean, if you would have time, like four weeks of time, to evaluate everything, to buy a map and whatever, um, then you would find the optimal path to Belk. But maybe it's faster to walk all the way around uh, via Mochenwangen and, and uh, yeah. Okay, a good solution that we find quickly is preferred over a solution that is optimal. That's also a, a nature of heuristics. It's actually, I mean, if, if I want to find a parking place for my car in Ravensburg. Then, uh, of course, I want to find a parking place which is as close to the cinema as possible if I want to go to the cinema. Um, but maybe it doesn't matter if the parking uh, place is 100 meters uh, more far away. Huh? Um, because it wouldn't be worth searching around for hours to find the optimal parking place. Okay, so that's about the nature of heuristics. Uh, how does the mathematical modeling of such a heuristic work? So we typically use a heuristic evaluation function f of s to evaluate states. So 
think of the, the chess game. Huh? And I'm in the situation to make the next move. So then, what will I do? I look at all the possible moves I can make. Maybe there are 30 different moves. And then I look at the successor states and evaluate all successor states and then I will take the move which brings me to the best successor state. And this function, evaluation function, f of s, evaluates my successor states. Huh? And uh, so the typically, not always, but most of the time, this evaluation function gives us an estimate of the costs from this successor state to the goal. Uh, so, and if this is the cost, then of course we want to minimize uh, this evaluation. Uh, okay, and what is a node in a search tree? A node is now, so up to now, a node was just the state. Uh, so, in case of chess, a node up to now was just the board position. So, if I have 30 different moves, then I come to 30 different successor nodes. But now, since we do heuristic evaluation, we add this heuristic evaluation value to the state. So the node is state plus heuristic evaluation and maybe some other information. Okay, here we have uh, the generic algorithm frame for heuristic search. Oh, look, this is not tr being translated. Of course, this should be goal. Huh? Um, so our, our program gets as uh, parameters a start node and a goal node. Huh? And our node list initially is just, uh, just contains this one start node. Huh? Okay, and then we go into this infinite loop um, and we first check um, if our node list is empty. If the node list is empty, then we return no solution. Uh, um, and then, uh, so in, uh, but in, uh, in the else case, if the node list is not empty, then we take uh, so, or we copy the first node in the list into the variable node and, uh, and uh, we actually remove this first node from the node list. So node list now is just the rest of the, of the list. <coughs> and then we, and now we check whether this new node, the first node of our list, um, um, is a goal node. So this function goal reached checks whether the current node is equal to the goal node. And the goal node is what we got here as a parameter. And if this is true, then of course we return solution found because then node is a solution node. And um, yes, okay, so, but I mean, so we are now talking about three cases. Case one is node list is empty. Case two is the first node is a solution node. And the third alternative is it's neither. So we have this first node, but it is not a solution node. In this case, we expand this first node and produce all the successor nodes. That's what this function successors does. I mean, this is not new, we, we had it before. So, successors of node produces a list of all the successors, and this function sort in, sorts all these nodes into our node list. And what do you think this function will use as a sorting key? We are talking about heuristic search now. Uh, evaluation function. Yes. So the, the value of our heuristic evaluation of every node. Huh? So then that means our node list all the time is sorted. 
starting with these nodes with the smallest evaluation value, with the smallest heuristic evaluation, and these, of course, are the most, the most interesting nodes. So our um, heuristic search, and you see, what we do here is we take the first node out of our, our node list uh, because the node list is sorted in uh, ascending order. Huh? Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, so this uh, remark is quite interesting. Depth first uh, search and breadth first search are special cases of the function heuristic search. Yeah? So this is really very generic. It even contains breadth first search and depth first search. And it's an exercise to you to think of, I mean, what, what, uh, what can be vary in this generic function? Um, it is actually the, uh, our evaluation function. Yeah? So what we have to modify in order to, uh, to get depth first search is the description of our nodes. We just have to replace our heuristic evaluation function by some very simple heuristic evaluation. Then we get depth first, search and if we take a different simple evaluation function then we get breadth first search. But that's, that's actually what we are not interested in now. Um, now we are interested in, uh, in heuristic evaluation functions that reduce the average branching factor. Huh? Um, okay, yes, and another remark, the ideal, the best heuristic would be a function that calculates the, the real cost from the current node to the goal. If I would really know for every node the costs to the goal, then of course I all the time would uh, expand the node with the smallest uh, cost to the goal. But the question is, uh, where do I get this real cost to the goal from? Who gives me this real cost? I mean, either there is an oracle, somebody who can ask, but this oracle has to be an omniscient oracle that knows everything. Typically, we don't have such an oracle. Okay, so if we don't have this oracle, of course we can get the real cost to the goal. But how can we get it? For example, by doing iterative deepening search. I mean, we do an iterative deepening search, and after this search, we know the costs for all nodes to the goal. But then we have already solved the problem, and starting with the heuristic search then wouldn't make sense. Okay, and that's why in, in a real world, we, we only can get a, an estimate for the cost. And now, yeah, yeah, let's look at this example. This is pr pretty similar to what I, um, what I talked about before, this uh, with the Grand Canyon between here and Belk. And here we have this Grand Canyon, and this woman wants uh, her husband uh, to pick her this flower. Um, yeah. And he thinks about fuel costs, but, but she doesn't. Okay. Now let's look at this example. So um, we now have uh, a map of southern Germany with cities and we know the costs between these cities. So suppose we are in Ulm, then our, the possible successor nodes are all these Stuttgart, Würzburg and so on and you know the costs to these successor nodes. That's what you know in, in uh, heuristic search, but you, don't, you do not know um, the costs from Ulm to some goal, say Salzburg. Yeah? Okay, 
Um, of course you can get the costs from Ulm to Salzburg depending on the path. Maybe you take this path here or you take this one. But this would mean doing the whole combinatorial search. Huh? So what we do now, we use an estimate for the cost to the goal. Um, so suppose we, sta we, we, we start in Ulm uh, and we want to drive to one of these other cities. And now what we can do, and this is actually not really hard, if we do have a topographic map of this area, then we can compute uh, the flying distance, so the, the, that is, that's the distance on a straight line between Ulm and any other city. I mean, this is not really difficult, and that's what we have listed here. These are the flying distances from Ulm to all the other cities. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, it's true. Yeah. These are the flying distances from city S to Ulm, but uh, because uh, flying between two cities is symmetric, um, uh, this is of course true too. Yeah. But, I mean, what's different is these flying distances from any city to Ulm, they are useful if Ulm is the goal. So we can start in any city and now search the optimal path to Ulm using this list of flying distances to Ulm. <coughs> okay, um, yeah. Now suppose we, we start in Linz. And, um, yeah. We start in Linz and we look at this list and list, this list tells us, okay, the heuristic estimate is 318 from Linz to Ulm. Um, that's what we just add to our note here. Huh? And then we look at our um, graph and we see that there are two possible successor nodes, Passau and Salzburg. Uh, and now we evaluate these two successor nodes. We evaluate Passau with a heuristic uh, value of 257 and we evaluate Salzburg with 236. So that's what we just get from the list. Yeah? So let's, let's go back. Um, so uh, Passau has 257 and Salzburg has 236. That's what we get here. And now we, we expand this node because... Why do we expand this guy and not this? Yes, because it's the minimum. Okay, we get two successors. We again evaluate a smaller one. Here we have three successors and then uh, Munich is the smallest value. And then we get these successors here and we, uh, we have Ulm as one of the successor nodes, of course with h equals zero and we are finished. Huh? Okay, yeah, fine. So now um, let's look at a different example. We, we start in Mannheim to Ulm, and then from Mannheim we have these uh, three successors, uh, and there is Nürnberg with a value of 132, um, and then we go to Ulm and we are finished. Yeah? Um, but there is a problem. Let's look at the graph. So what did we do? Mannheim, Nürnberg, Ulm. Um, Mannheim, Nürnberg, Ulm. Yeah? And this is not the optimal uh, route 
it would be better, I guess, to do Mannheim, Karlsruhe, Stuttgart, Ulm. Huh? Even so, we did, um, I mean, we looked at all the successors of Mannheim, which are Frankfurt, Karlsruhe, and Nürnberg. Did we do that? Yes. Frankfurt, Karlsruhe, and Nürnberg. And Nürnberg is the best guy, so we use this, and that's what we find. But it's not the optimal solution. So now now, uh, what's the reason why this is not optimal? There is a better route, which is this one. So look at this route, it has a cost of 401 and this route is much uh, better. What's the reason? Uh, what was our fault here? Or how could we improve it, our heuristic search algorithm? We could improve it by uh, using the costs between the nodes. Or look at these. Uh, which costs between which nodes? Between uh, Mannheim and the successor nodes. Yes, that's true. We did not consider these costs. Especially, the, the problem was, we did not consider that there is a cost of 230 from Mannheim to Nürnberg. Huh? So we just looked at this successor node, which is Nürnberg, and then at Frankfurt and at Karlsruhe, and among these three nodes, Nürnberg is the best guy. But we did not uh, consider that it's uh, pretty costly from Mannheim to Nürnberg. Huh? So we just neglected this. Huh? Um, that's the problem. Huh? And that's why we call this algorithm greedy search because it greedily grabs the best successor node. This is the best successor node. Huh? Um, but it would, uh, it would have been uh, better to, uh, to add these costs to the evaluations and then you see 67 and 230, uh, 30, it's a big difference. It would have been better to add uh, the costs to the successor nodes, yes. And not only the costs to the successor nodes, so now if we travel this one step to Karlsruhe and then um, we look at all the alternatives, would be Stuttgart and Basel, and then we have 64, and, uh, so 64 plus the heuristics from Stuttgart to Ulm. Yeah? Um, but we also have to add the 67 here. So we have to use the whole cost for the yet traveled uh, route and add the heuristic evaluation. That's much better. Um, yeah. And that uh, brings us to uh, the so-called A star search. Oh, again, uh, a German. Oh, sorry, there is so much German here. Um, yeah. And in a star search, we actually do what we just mentioned. We use a heuristic evaluation function, which is the sum of the up to now traveled uh, route plus the heuristic evaluation. So the costs from the current node to node S plus the heuristic estimation from uh, the node S to the goal. Huh? Yeah. Okay. And now uh, we need a definition for our A star search, which uh, is the term admissible. A heuristic cost estimate function H of S that never overestimates 
the actual cost from state S to the goal is called admissible. Huh? Okay, and now what is the uh, A-star algorithm? That's pretty simple. We use our heuristic search algorithm with this uh, combined evaluation function and an admissible heuristic H. That's what we uh, have uh, then with the A-star algorithm. Huh? Um, and now look what the A-star algorithm does when we start in Frankfurt and want to go to Ulm. So let's look at the picture. We start here in Frankfurt and we want to travel to Ulm. Huh? And now we do A star. Um, and what, what we see here is a snapshot after um, we have expanded these uh, four leaf nodes. So in the first step we start in Frankfurt. So now, now let me explain uh, this notation. This first figure is the cost of the route we have traveled already, which of course in the beginning is zero. Yeah? And uh, the second figure is the heuristic estimate to the goal, and the third figure is the sum of the first two. So this is actually our function g, this is the function h, and this is the sum which is f. Yeah? f is equal to g plus h. And this is of course the relevant value which we use for deciding what to do. Okay, and now let's do one step. Evaluate Würzburg and Mannheim. So the cost to Würzburg is 111, estimate 153, and the sum is 264. Uh, and uh, similar for Mannheim, and you see we will then expand Mannheim because it's better. And then we get these uh, three successor nodes. And now uh, th that's very important. What we do in heuristic search, we do not a depth first search and we do not do a breadth first search on this tree. What, what do we do? So how does our search proceed with, uh, when we have this tree here? Do we continue with this node because it's higher up in the tree or do we continue with this? Yeah? Uh, we continue with Würzburg because the evaluation function is the lowest cost. Yes, that's the point. So uh, the depth in the tree does not matter at all. We just look at our heuristic evaluation function f. Okay, so which is these four values and this is the smallest value. So we expand Würzburg and we get these four successor nodes and we still have these three guys in addition to these four. So we are actually at this stage. These are at the moment the open nodes. And now we compare all the F values and see that Karlsruhe has the smallest one and that's why we expand Karlsruhe and, um, and now be careful. Now when we have expanded Karlsruhe we are at that point. Huh? And then we look among all the nodes and we see Stuttgart has the smallest value and then we get these successor nodes and among them there is Ulm with 323. Huh? Um, but now you see that this is not our solution path. Because we already had Ulm here. Okay? Yes, but I mean, if we already had Ulm here, why didn't we stop at this point? Why didn't we stop here? We, the optimal solution is this guy. Why didn't we stop when we had evaluated these four nodes and these three? Why did we continue searching here? Hmm. 
which was actually useless. You see, this is the optimal solution and not, and not this. So imagine all the nodes on level, on depth 2, these seven nodes uh, have been uh, produced. They are the open nodes. And suppose you do not know what's below them. Why is it important at that point to evaluate, uh, to, to expand the node uh, Karlsruhe? What might happen if we would not expand it? There could be a better solution. Yes, there could be a better solution. Look. Our estimate for Ulm here is 294 and here it's 289. So suppose the cost here would be 1 to Stuttgart and 1 to Ulm, then we would have 291, which is better than this guy. You see our algorithm that expands the node with the smallest f value I don't know whether you see it but maybe you feel it you get a feeling that this seems to be optimal huh? it tries to find the optimal solution huh? And why do we really have to expand this guy? Yeah, because, I mean, the point is this is an underestimate. Our heuristic is admissible. It never overestimates the cost to the goal node. If it underestimates, um, then this guy um, may really produce, uh, may, but not sure, it may produce a solution shorter than this one. No? Okay, so that's how the A star search uh, works. We don't need an, an uh, pseudocode because we had it already, but we need, of course, a proof. First, let's state our theorem. The theorem says the A star algorithm is optimal, that means it always finds the solution with uh, lowest cost first. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so now how can we prove this? What we will prove now is suppose our a uh, search algorithm finds a solution node L. Yeah? Finds a solution node L and then if there is another solution node L prime which al our search algorithm did not find then the cost to this other uh, solution node is bigger. Yeah? Or, no, it, it, it does not need to be bigger, but it's greater than or equal. Uh, so it may be equal, but then we have two optimal nodes. And this node L still is optimal. So if we have proven this property, then we are finished. Then we have proven that a solu the, the solution node that our algorithm finds first is optimal. Okay, so, um, yeah. Now let's prove that this is the optimal node. Now, 
we, we just compute um, the, the cost to this solution node. So we are actually, we arrived at this solution node, so we don't need a heuristic evaluation, we just know the cost from our starting node to this node L, which is G of L. Yeah? And uh, because we already arrived at L, the heuristic uh, estimate from L to L, of course, is zero. So then we, we just can add this zero here. Um, and this is, of course, equal to F of L. Yeah? So th that means uh, the heuristic estimate at L is equal to the cost from the start to L. And now the heuristic estimate of L is less than or equal to the heuristic estimate to an alternative node S. Why? Why uh, is this less than or equal? Think of our search algorithm. Suppose, I mean, here we have a couple of open nodes. And we, we are at this point. We, uh, so we expanded this node L. Obviously, before we went into this node S. Now, why is then f of l less than or equal to s? Yeah, because we sort our nodes by our um, heuristic estimate value. So this is the sorting key, and that's the right reason why we first evaluated l. Yeah? So we first expanded this node l because f of l is less than or equal to f of s. If it would be the other way around, we would have uh, tried this guy first. Okay, so we have this f of l is less than or equal to f of s, and f of s, of course, is g of s plus h of s. So g of s is the cost from the root to this node s, huh? plus um, the estimate from S to some um, goal node L prime. Uh, yes, so, and now, why is this heuristic estimate we do here at S less than or equal to G of L prime? Why do we have this here? Or maybe a, 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 a simpler question. What is the difference between f of s and g of l prime? What is f of s? Can somebody explain me and tell me exactly what is f of s? No? The actual cost to s plus the estimated cost um, from s to l prime. Yes, yes. So it's all together, it's the estimated cost to travel from our starting node via the node S to the goal. Okay? And what is G of L prime? We have assumed that L prime is an alternative solution, solution node to L. So what is uh, G of L prime? G 
g of l prime is the real cost the real cost from the, solu from the starting node via s to our solution node ok and why is the real cost to the solution node greater than or equal to the estimate from some intermediate node s why Because the estimate is always lower. Yes. Yeah. And this is because we required our heuristic to be admissible. Huh? That's why we, this less than or equal here is very important. Uh, we would not get this unless our heuristic is admissible. So we really need our heuristic to be admissible to get this less than or equal. If the heuristic would not be admissible, then we might have a greater or equal and then the whole inequality wouldn't hold anymore. You see, and so now what is the result? The result is g of L is less than or equal to g of L prime. And that means we can, uh, we can really use this solution we first found. So, um, as soon as our uh, heuristic search algorithm with an admissible heuristic um, finds a solution node, then it's the optimal node. Or it, not the, it is an optimal node. So there may be other optimal nodes. It may be the case that this is an equal and this is an equal and then uh, the cost to these two nodes is the same, so we have two optimal nodes, but anyway, we can then of course publish this guy as, uh, as the solution node. Okay? Any questions? So let's continue. Okay, uh, yes, um, but of course we still have a problem with our A star search. Look at this picture. The, the darker nodes, the gray nodes, they, these are the currently open nodes in our search tree. And this picture looks pretty similar to what we did in uh, breadth first search. Huh? So we have quite a big number of open nodes. This number is much smaller than it was in breadth first search. Why is it smaller? How, uh, I mean, how much nodes would we, uh, or what would the set of nodes be in breadth first search? Why would it be uh, uh, um, quite bigger? Now, what, what would Brett's first search do if we start in Frankfurt? I mean, this uh, is kind of surprising to me because it's so, so, such a simple algorithm. What does Brett's first search do? It produces all the nodes on level 1, then all on level 2, and then all nodes on level 3, which means we produce all the successors of these guys too, and of these guys. So at level 3 we, we have many nodes, and on level 4 we have even more nodes. So maybe we, we would have uh, something like 30 nodes here, and here it's uh, much less. Huh? So, you see the advantage of the heuristic. The, what, what does our heuristic do? Our heuristic um, goes down the tree at some points selectively deeper. Huh? But breadth first would have needed to go all the way down to here and uh, expand the whole tree. And, and our heuristic search does a kind of a selective 
um, a search which goes down selectively deeper at certain points, at that point, which may be more attractive. Okay, so the storage consumption of a star is much better than it is in breadth first search, but still, you see, it is a type of breadth first search and therefore a star in realistic problems with, with large branching factors is not practical either. Um, so if our search algorithm is pretty fast and produces many nodes per second, then it will very fastly fill up all our memory. So this is not implementable either. And the solution for this problem is called IDA star, iterative deepening A star. And, and uh, the idea is pretty simple. We do the same thing we did before. We do iterative deepening, but not iterative deepening on the depth of the search tree, but rather on the heuristic evaluation function. So we put a limit on our f value. Look at this picture. Um, so this search front that we have here um, could have been produced with a heuristic limit of 550. So we start our A star search, but we limit the depth. And we say, okay, let's limit, uh, not the depth, sorry, we limit the F value. If the limit of the F value would have been 547, then we would have gotten all these nodes here, and maybe some other nodes, maybe something here below Stuttgart and some other nodes, um, but we would get a search front like this, not this one, but like this. Um, yes. And then we would do the whole search, but not like this. So by really opening all these nodes, no, we would do a depth first search with the limit on the F value. So you put a limit on the F value, but do just ordinary depth first search and all the time check whether our F value is below the, the threshold. That's it. So that is then iterative deepening A star. Yeah. Oh yes, we, um, we should talk about this problem. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the, the, the normal A star has the memory problem, but it has another problem, which is a problem of, um, of uh, runtime. Um, we already talked about this last time. The list of our open nodes, which are here the gray nodes, it must be sorted. And the node with the smallest f value is at the beginning of the list. And um, whenever I produce a couple of new nodes, for example these three new nodes, then they have to be sorted into the list. And this sorting in um, takes quite a bit of time so this is, um, if we do it naively, this time is linear in the length of the list. Huh? But if we use um, heap sort, then we can do it in logarithmic time. So we can do the sorting in, in logarithmic time, and we can also get any node, uh, no, I, um, sorry. So what we need in our A star algorithm is the first node, so the node with the smallest evaluation, we can also get this node 
in logarithmic time. So sorting in in logarithmic time and getting the, uh, the smallest node in logarithmic time also. So heap sort would be an uh, optimal method for managing this search tree. Okay, um, but anyway, I mean, even with heap sort, we cannot solve the memory problem. Huh? Uh, so A star is not a practical algorithm. The practical algorithm is iterative deepening, um, but with a limit for the heuristic evaluation. That's what I explained before. Okay, yeah. So that's, uh, that's actually all I wanted to tell you about heuristic search algorithms. A star still is the best uh, up to now known uh, heuristic search algorithm, but of course um, the, uh, the quality of A star, that means the runtime it takes to solve a problem strongly depends on what? of course on our heuristic estimate h. If this function h is bad, then I mean we, we may do uh, um, a star, but it's, it's extremely bad. And that's what we look at now. Huh? Um, we, we now look at the eight puzzle problem and we compare two different heuristic evaluation functions. Um, and the first question is, how can we find a good heuristic evaluation function for a star? And we know that for a star, a heuristic evaluation function must be admissible. Huh? So it, uh, it is not allowed to overestimate the cost to the goal. So it must always give me the exact value, which would be the best, or it is allowed to underestimate. And a good example was this flying distance in case of such uh, traffic uh, routing problems. Um, now let's look at the eight puzzle. Suppose this is the current state and this is the goal state. Huh? And now um, an admissible heuristic for the number of movements of tiles is just the number of tiles which are not in the correct position. So let's count it. Um, so this guy is not correct. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. This is correct. Seven, Eight. Yeah? Oh no, so, sorry, uh, seven. Because, yeah, we should not ca count the empty, the empty tile. So, uh, so it's seven. The heuristic is seven. Um, and of course, I mean, you, you cannot be faster than this. There is no chance. This heuristic actually corresponds to a simpler eight puzzle problem. Can you describe the simpler eight puzzle problem that could be solved starting from here in seven steps? How can you simplify the rules and then solve this eight puzzle problem in seven steps? Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, it's actually a tile, a sliding puzzle, but if you are allowed to take the three out here and put it in there, uh, and then this is the empty uh, field, and then we take the eight and put it here, 
that would cost us exactly seven steps. And this is a, a very interesting idea. So if for any problem, maybe in your bachelor thesis, you have to solve some search problem, I have no idea about what, to, what it is, but then if you're looking for a heuristic to um, improve the search speed, then try to simplify your problem. Simplify your problem, solve the simplified problem, and then use the solution cost of the simplified problem as a heuristic for the harder problem. That's the way how to find good heuristic evaluation functions. That's what we did here. We simplified the game and said, okay, let's allow to take the three out and put it here. And then we get this uh, cost. This is the real cost for the simplified problem and we use this real cost for the simplified problem as a heuristic estimate for our original problem. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean we could even simplify the problem uh, even more. We could, for example, say, okay, I have two hands. So, and let me be allowed to move two tiles at the same time, and then our heuristic would be even, it, it would be only four. Huh? Or maybe I, I am a robot that has uh, eight hands, and then I could solve uh, the puzzle in one step. Would that be a better heuristic? No, because, <laughs> I mean, this is intuitively obvious. If I take as a heuristic evaluation uh, just one all the time, then our heuristic is the same all the time, and that wouldn't be good. So it would, it would actually be better to have a heuristic evaluation that gives us a bigger value Huh? That's better. Look, look at heuristic number two, which we call the Manhattan distance. And uh, the Manhattan distance is, so look at this tile number three. And now, I mean, in the real aid puzzle, this tile number three has to do some moves like one, two, three. And this is actually the, th the, the shortest root for this tile with the three on it. So there is no shorter way than one, two, three. Of course you could do it like that, one, two, three. You could also do it like one, two, three, four, five. There are many uh, paths from, uh, from here to this goal, but the shortest root has three steps. Okay? And that's why for this tile we count the three moves. For this we need at least three uh, steps and then, I mean, we, we just look at this guy. We need at least one step, then for the five we need one, for the one we need at least one step, uh, for the four we need one step, for the eight we need two steps at least, for the seven we need zero, for this one we need three, and for this one we need one. And the sum is 10. And this is a much better heuristic evaluation. I mean, it still underestimates, so it's still admissible, but it is closer to the real cost. It is closer to the real cost, and therefore this is the better heuristic evaluation. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, one of your exercises is to implement uh, a star and implement these two heuristics for the eight puzzle. I mean, the reason why I took the eight puzzle as an example here is it's very easy to implement on your computer. <coughs> huh? You just need a data structure, which is a three by three array, and then you put these numbers into the, uh, the array um, and sliding the tiles around is pretty easy to program. Um, 
So you program a star and you program the eight parcel and you also uh, write a program for ID A star for the iterative deepening A star uh, because uh, the A star yeah with A star you will see you can't solve the eight parcel for any configuration I mean it depends if this is your goal state it depends on how far your starting state is from the goal state and if it's too far away your search tree gets uh, too big and you will have problems with a star storage problems um, but with uh, iterative deepening a star this, this will work definitely okay um, yeah so I did an implementation in Mathematica and I show you the results now um, yeah so um, look at these two columns first this is without a heuristic and I produced a number of different eight puzzles where the search tree had a depth of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 huh? um, Yeah, let's look at the slide before. Um, so I produced 133 randomly generated eight puzzle problems. And among these randomly generated eight puzzle problems, there are some with a, uh, a depth of two, four, six, eight, and so on. Um, okay. Yeah, and if we look at iter iterative deepening for this step two, we have 20 steps to solve the problem with this time, and you see uh, the time increases exponentially with the depth of the search tree, which is not surprising. Yeah? Um, and the computing time also, it, it increases linearly with the number of steps, of course. Um, and here we have no figures anymore because um, uh, the times were too big. I mean, this is 75 seconds and I, I didn't have the patience to wait longer. No? And now look at these columns with the heuristics. Here we have heuristic H1, which is the simple heuristic I just presented you. No? Um, yeah. look at the number of steps I mean this is the average number of steps over these 132 problems averaged this is the time and I mean the first thing you see is that our heuristic search is much better than iterative deepening so this is by a factor of 100, 1,000 better huh? here. Yeah. And it is not just better in terms of the number of steps. I mean, what is the factor by in terms of the number of steps is even bigger. It's even bigger than 1,000. Um, but here it's, it's almost exactly 1,000 here it is something like uh, 3,000 why is the factor here bigger than it was here? because the evaluation function has to be calculated yes because in heuristic search in every step I have to calculate the evaluation function and the evaluation function of course is more costly than all the rest of our search algorithm I mean I really have to look at many tiles and count how many steps and so on no not count how many steps here I just have to count how many tiles are not in the correct place so that means I have to look at all the tiles 
If I look at heuristic number two, here I even have to count the number of steps every tile is away from the goal. But still this heuristic is better. It's, it's a by a factor of two better here in this tree. But of course the interesting thing is below here with the bigger trees with these steps um, and then I mean here you see heuristic H2 is a factor of two better but here it's already more than a factor of 10 better and the bigger the search tree is the bigger the gain is. And why is this? The reason is because our heuristic reduces the average branching factor. And I computed from these results the, uh, the effective branching factor which in uninformed search here is 2.8. With heuristic H1 it turns out to be 1.5 and with H2 it turns out to be 1.3. So you see there is a dramatic gain um, with heuristic H1 and here it's, it's not I mean the branching factor is not much smaller just 0.2 smaller but you see it, you get a dramatic uh, gain in computing time okay and I mean you will so it's your exercise to reproduce this table but of course you will I guess not use such a slow uh, programming li language like Mathematica. Even if you use Python, it will be maybe by a factor of 10 faster. And if you use C or Java, it will be even faster. No? But uh, I mean, the results will be kind of similar to this table, hopefully. OK, any questions about these results here? I mean, this is a finding this heuristic search algorithm um, was one of the big success stories in AI. Um, I mean, these algorithms were found in, I guess, the mid 80s, huh? which is uh, like 25 years ago. At that time, Many people believed that you just need to use a parallel computer and then you can solve all these search problems and you can uh, have an extremely good uh, chess computer. But this turned out to be not true at all. And why is this not true? Or, no, let's, let's put it the other way around. Why is it much better to use heuristic H2 than having any parallel computer without a heuristic? Why is this, and even heuristic H1, is better than any parallel computer? Why? This is very important. Why is it much better to use heuristic H1 rather than any parallel computer? It yeah? reduces the computation time exponentially and a parallel computer can only reduce it linearly. It can only reduce it by a constant factor. That's the point. The, the gain you get from your parallel computer is constant. So if you have an extremely good parallel computer with an extremely good implementation with 1,000 processors, then at most you can get a speed up of 1,000. Okay? And I mean, yeah, look at this. We had a speed up with H1 of 1000 already with this small tree. And down here it's way better. It's way better. Huh? So maybe here we have a, a speed up of 100,000. 
So you would need a parallel computer with 100,000 processors to get the speed of heuristic H1. Okay, uh, maybe you say, okay, suppose we have a parallel computer with a million processors or maybe 10 million processors, which is not really realistic. Yeah? But suppose you would have one, then of course I can immediately give, give you a depth, maybe it is depth 25, um, oh no, it's not so big, maybe it's 22, where H1 is even better than your uh, computer with uh, 10 million processors. And this is very important. Uh, so intelligence, if you, and, and I would call using such a heuristic, this, this is what I would call intelligent. So this intelligence gives you a much higher speed up than any constant factor if your problem only gets big enough. And I mean this is actually not the problem to, to make our search problems big enough. They are big enough. They are actually too big. And of course it helps to use this parallel computer. But the parallel computer alone is no help at all. So use the parallel computer but please implement the heuristics on the parallel computer and then you have the really good gain. And that's what people learned actually in chess computers. I will show you at the end of this chapter um, of, um, the state of the art in chess computers and the best now existing chess computer runs on a smartphone. So it does not use much computing uh, power. It runs on a smartphone and it is better than the best uh, chess computer they had before which had thousands of parallel processors. I mean, yeah, this, is, this is what AI is. I mean, intelligence really beats hardware. That's, uh, that's the maybe the, the uh, shorthand of this uh, Nice result. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what did we learn from this? Yeah, iterative deepening is the only practically useful uninformed search algorithms. IDA star is the iterative deepening variant of A star. It is complete, fast, and memory efficient. And, of course, good heuristics reduce the effective branching factor. Um, so, and finding a good heuristic, this is your task still. No? So you can use these algorithms, but for your particular application, you have to find a good heuristic manually. No? I will in a few minutes talk about how we automatically can produce good heuristics. This is also possible in some cases. Okay, uh, and this, but this is a very important remark. When the problem is unsolvable, yeah, let's uh, go back to this uh, table here. The problems I used here have all been solvable eight puzzle problems. But there are unsolvable eight puzzle problems where there is no solution. Can you understand this? Can there be unsolvable eight puzzle problems? Yes, there are. How can that work? Yes. You just take two tiles, two tiles which are neighbor tiles, out and just switch them. And then it's unsolvable. I'll, I'll explain you it with the, the three puzzle. The three puzzle is this puzzle. Uh, one, two, three, and the empty uh, tile here. And now if you, if you start your three puzzle 
with this configuration, 3, 1, 2, there is no chance to solve it. And it is the same with the 8 puzzle. There are, I mean, you can, you can draw a graph of all the, the states and their neighbors. I mean, a neighbor state of this one would be putting the 2 down here. 1, 2, 3. This is a neighbor state in the graph. But, I mean, there is one graph, one connected graph, but there is no connection to the second graph or second part of the graph. Um, and therefore, if you start with this position, you never get into, into this part of the graph. And the same thing is with the, with the eight puzzle, it also has two disconnected parts of the graph. So be careful when you program the eight puzzle. Do not just use any random starting states because then quite often you would produce unsolvable eight puzzle problems. Okay, now you know what's an unsolvable eight puzzle problem. And my question is, or uh, let's, let's say this table would be quite different if you would use unsolvable eight puzzle problems. What would change in this table? I mean, what would happen if you start your A star search with an unsolvable eight puzzle problem? What would happen to your A star search? Don't worry about uh, computing times, the, de the details of the table for a moment. What would happen? Can you say a whole sentence? The computing time. Yeah. Yeah, why? Yeah, because you never will find the solution. And you will always uh, look at the distance to the solution. It will never be zero and uh, yeah, it will never termi terminate. So we would actually have an infinite everywhere in the, in the whole table. Huh? It does not depend on heuristic or not. Um, but we could, maybe if we look at our eight parcel problem a little closer, um, maybe we could uh, make the problem finite. How could we make the, I mean, put a threshold, uh, a limit on the computation time? How could we put that? Probably do. I mean, we would need to do some investigation on our eight puzzle and find out how um, the how the hardest eight puzzle problem looks like, and that means how many steps our optimal solution would take at most. Huh? This is the hardest problem, and suppose the hardest problem, the optimal solution for the hardest problem has, let's say, 30 moves. And then, of course, we could limit the whole tree to a depth of 30 because we would be sure if there is a solution, then after 30 steps, our optimal solution would be found. And then we could limit the depth of the whole tree to a depth of 30. And now, if we would limit the depth to 30, how would this table look like?
I mean, of course, we would have only one line with a depth of 30 because always we would search the whole tree. So we would have down there this line at depth 30. But how would be the comparison between iterative deepening, H1, and H2? Of course, iterative deepening would be the best because the overhead for computing the heuristic would be zero. Huh? So it would be much faster and the number of nodes, the whole tree up to a depth of 30 would be evaluated. All the time it would be evaluated here and here and here. So the heuristic would not save any nodes at all because it would never find a solution. So in the worst case, if your heuristic does not help you, you have to evaluate the whole tree. And that would be actually very bad for both the heuristics. So the solution or the conclusion, the conclusion here is that um, in case of unsolvable problems, the heuristic is not of any help. No, it's actually worse with the heuristics than without the heuristic because of the overhead to, to calculate the heuristic. And this is, yeah, I mean, this is not, not a nice result. So that, uh, yeah, that result means uh, your heuristic search can even be much worse than just doing the brute force search. But this problem can actually be solved by a little bit of parallelism. You could do the following thing. You use one computer running heuristic H2 and use in parallel a second computer which does no heuristic at all. And then if our problem is unsolvable, then this second computer will eventually be much faster than our heuristics computer. Huh? Okay, yeah, oh, we have to stop. Okay, thank you.